Hey guys, I'm Dave Troll and welcome to the Troll Gallery. Recently a client contacted me because she's got four round columns in her entryway and, well, she hates them. We decided how best to change the look of the columns and decided that we would exchange the round ones that are there now with rectangular columns. These columns are going to be painted when they're finished, so we went with poplar and birch ply for the construction. She also didn't like how the old columns left plenty of spaces for dust to accumulate, so we designed the new columns to sit flush against the wall. Let's take a look at how that build went. The first step in the process was to rip down the style stock of the post covers. For these posts, the wide portion is 3 quarters of an inch thick poplar, and I ripped that down so it was an inch and a half wide. They're still long, and I'll cut them to length later. If you notice, my riving knife is not there, and there's a whole video on that, and I'll attach that link below. Next comes the narrow styles. These are cut at 3 quarters of an inch wide. This project is going to be painted, so rather than go to the trouble to miter the corners, I'll just butt them together. The three quarters of an inch of the narrow style added to the thickness of the wide styles will equal an inch and a half. I'm still not getting a great rip cut off my table saw blade, and there isn't one coming, so I ran the styles through the planer to clean them up. By ganging four pieces together, they're stable enough to run through. I did this both for the narrow and the wide styles to clean them up. A few light passes and the saw marks were cleaned up and the pieces were at their final width. It's time to switch over and start preparing the rails and that starts with riveting them to width. Most of the rail will be hidden by some trim, but only an inch and a half will show when the post is installed. Once enough wide stock was cut, I adjusted the fence and cut the narrow stock as well. Before trimming the rails to length, I cut one inch square and rather than rely on my measurements, I set two styles together, placed the squared end of the rail in place and measured over to the full width of the panel. Things happen and drawings don't always match reality. This way I can be sure that the final dimension is correct and not worry about my math. I can now set up my stop block on my crosscut sled and cut the first set of rails to length. Once that was done, I repeated the measurement process, adjusted my stop block, and cut the other rails to length. With the styles and rails prepared, it was time to switch over to my dado set and cut the groove for the quarter inch plywood panel. Now I've had this dado set forever and at one point I sent it out to get sharpened and the two spacers glued to the outer blades fell off. I wasn't too pleased at the time, but I realized that without those spacers, I could cut a snug groove for quarter inch plywood. I started with the rails and set the fence to center the groove as closely as I could. My calipers told me I was off by ten thousandths of an inch and I could live with that. I still labeled the fence side of the stock with an F so that minor error wouldn't be an issue during assembly. I also set the depth to three eighths of an inch so there'd be an adequate room for the panels. When it came time to cut the grooves in the styles, I added a fingerboard to hold the stock tight against the fence, since I noticed a little bowing in a few of the pieces. This fingerboard worked fine on my old saw, but it needed a little tweaking to work on this one. Using the same setup again, I marked the fence side of the stock with an F and I cut the grooves in the wide styles as well. The next step was to drill the pocket holes in the rails to attach them to the styles. I got out my vintage Craig 1200 and set it up with 3 quarter inch stock and began drilling. The key here is to keep the F out. I mean keep the side marked F on the outside of the jig so that you can assemble later. The F side now becomes the outside face and the quarter inch grooves will all line up well. The narrow rails got two holes in each side and the wider rails got three. I offset the holes so it wouldn't interfere with the panel groove and the center hole was just by eye.
Okay, guys, we have a little challenge. Maybe it's poor planning. One of the things that I find true about woodworking is it's not about being the most impeccable woodworker, never making mistakes, but how to fix the mistakes that you make in a project. We have such an opportunity. When I was going to fasten these pieces together, we're going to use pocket hole screws and do the style to the rail. But what I didn't realize when I was milling all the stock is where the screw comes out lines up almost perfectly with the groove for our panel. You can see that there's essentially no thread left to grab the material. That's a problem. But I have a solution. Let's see how this one goes. I milled up some filler strips to just fit in the grooves of the styles. Half were the length of the upper rails and half were the length of the lower rails. I also made sure to keep in mind that half of the styles are for the left and half of the styles are for the right. This keeps the groove for the panel and the face side in the correct place for assembly. I put a long filler strip on one end of each piece and held it in place with glue and some 23 gauge pins. I then turned the styles around and set a panel in place to set the spacing for the other filler strip. I made sure the panel was just snug against the first filler strip and glued in the second strip, leaving about a sixteenth of an inch space for final assembly. This piece was glued and pinned in place as well. Now I could go back and begin assembling the panels. I started by inserting a panel into one of the styles and holding the panel up with one of the extra rail pieces. I could then add glue to one edge of the lower rail and screw it in place. I used a Craig BFC, which I think means big freaking clamp, to help hold the two faces in line. Mine's been around a while and I think they call them a six inch project clamp now. I used inch and a quarter fine thread pocket hole screws to lock the pieces together. I flipped the panel around and repeated the process for the top rail. Glue, clamp, screw. By moving the clamp for each screw, I was able to ensure that the rails and styles stayed flush across their joint. Back in the day, I had a Craig heavy duty bench clamp system that made all this work much simpler. Sadly, when I sold my table saw, that went with it. I look forward to picking one of those up again soon. It was time to add the second style. I started by putting glue on the end of both rails, putting the style on the panel, and lowering it onto the rail one end at a time to keep the glue clean at minimum. Then it was time to clamp and screw one end together. I could flip the panel and clamp and screw the other end in place. You may notice some marks on the materials as I work. I still have the F for face on the styles and rails and an X on the back side of the panels. These all help me keep the good side out. I marked the back side of the panel because I'd pre-sanded the faces of them before assembly. Sometimes it helps to pull the styles and rails together with a clamp to ensure that the screws don't have to do all the work. While I had the panels handy, I added a bead of glue to the center section and initially just clamped them in place to remove any bowing of the panels. After a panel or two, I switched over from clamping to pin nailing the panels in place. A few half inch pins along the length of the panel and everything stayed square. Once the glue had dried, it was time to clean up the joints and machine marks. I started by going over each joint with a pencil, marking up both sides of the joint. Then I started sanding with 120 grit paper on my random orbit sander. I could easily see when a joint was smooth when all the pencil marks were gone. This trick works great on closed grain woods like poplar. Open grain woods like oak can get messy since the graphite from the pencil can sometimes get into the open grain and cause more work than necessary. Since these columns will be painted, I could use simple wood filler to close up any gaps in the joints. That will all be cleaned up during the final sanding. 
I took the panels from my table saw and trimmed off the excess styles using my crosscut sled. I lined up the outer edge of the rail with a zero clearance cut in my sled and trimmed off the excess. The panel is supported with a work stand that's outside of the shot. I just flipped the panel over and cut the other end as well. It's assembly time. I set two side panels next to each other and added glue to one of them. The second panel is there just for support. I could then set the front face of the column on the sides and carefully align them top to bottom and side to side. Once I had the first corner where I wanted it, I fastened it in place with inch and a quarter finish nails. Brads would work here too, or even pin nails, and those would have left a much smaller crater to fill in later. I can now work my way down the length of the piece, ensuring that the two pieces lined up as closely as possible. And don't worry, my fingers are well clear of any stray nails coming out of the gun, although that last nail was a little closer than I'd like. I could then flip the stock, making sure that the top of the first sections lined up with the top of the other side and added glue to that panel. It may be hard to see, but the side style getting fastened to the face styles are only three quarters of an inch wide. Like I said, their width, plus the thickness of the front styles, gives the illusion of inch and a half wide styles on all sides. I set the first assembly on the final side and made sure it was aligned closely as possible. Then I can go ahead and nail the two together, making sure that everything is lined up correctly along the way. It's worth taking your time here to ensure both pieces line up correctly. Once that was complete, I could fill all the nail holes and any minor gaps in the joints with a little wood putty, again, to be sanded away later. After the putty had time to dry, I sanded everything to 220 grit, and I wiped it down and blew off any of the dust. Then I taped any areas that might be glued together during the installation. That includes the miters on the base and cap pieces you see here, as well as the sides of the backs and the insides of the columns where the backs would be attached. Then all the pieces were given a coat of primer inside and out. Priming the inside helps to keep the sock stable. Leaving it unprimed would allow the inside to absorb more moisture than the outside and that could cause uneven wood movement in the future. In hindsight, I might have primed the inside of the column before assembly because it's a tight space and, well, a pain in the butt to get good proper coverage. I could have also used my spray gun instead of a brush, but I really want to keep that for clear finishes and not coming up with paint. I'm sure with proper finishing that really wouldn't make a difference, but I'm just a little twitchy about stuff like that. Before giving the exterior a second coat of primer, I sanded down the first coat again with 220 grit paper. I removed any drips, flecks, or lines in the column, and this left a smooth surface so the second coat would flow out nicely. I didn't bother with the inside since it'll never be seen. I also took the time to fill any holes, and cracks, or checks that showed up with some wood putty. Once that dried, I sanded those areas and got ready for the second coat. One last wipe down and blow off, and the parts were ready for their second coat of primer. I took my time to make sure that I got good coverage but didn't leave any drips or streaks. It pays to be patient and use a good brush and quality primer. A smooth finish here will make the final paint job go so much easier. When the primer had dried, it was time to caulk the panels. I cut the tip of the tube as small as I could and ran a small bead between the panel and the style and rails. Since I want a nice crisp line, I couldn't clean up the excess with my finger so I used a composite shim that I had laying around and used that to clean up the excess. One or two passes on each joint did the trick. Wiping off the excess caulk on a paper towel kept the whole thing nice and neat. The last step was to wipe the joint down with a damp paper towel to remove the last little bits and smooth everything out. I had pre-drilled the holes to attach the sides of the columns to the backs. That included a 3 8 inch diameter recess about a quarter of an inch deep. Once I assembled the columns in place, I'd need to fill those holes. So I put a 3 8 inch plug cutter in my drill press and carefully cut the plugs I needed. 
I'd need about 24 plugs, so I drilled about 35. Some will be damaged, some will get lost, and some extra never hurts. I set up my table saw with the blade just high enough to cut through the first set of plugs and set my fence so there was just about a quarter of an inch of stock to the outside of the blade. As I made the pass across the saw, the plugs were cut free and at the correct thickness of the whole dead tree drilled. Oh yeah, and they went everywhere, which is part of the reason I cut extra. I raised the height of the blade and repeated the two cuts for the remainder of the plugs. I hope you forgive me for not filming the installation, but I was on the clock and it ended up being a long day. I started off by removing the existing round columns, their crowns, and trimming their bases. Next, I attached the back panel to the wall with five two-inch screws. I had to double check that I was lined up and centered on the existing base plate because that's going to show in the final assembly. None of those plates were square to the wall. A shim here and there and some careful measuring and that was all it took. Then I was able to slide the columns into place. Okay, two of the four had to be trimmed a bit, but the other two fit fine. I lined up the columns in their backs and screwed them together working from bottom to top. It took little fussing, but the seam between the two pieces was minimal when I finished. Now it was time to come back and fill the screw holes with the plugs we cut. A little glue on each one and a few taps on my mallet and they were set. A few sat a bit proud and I trimmed those with my chisel. Then I came back and cleaned them all up with 220 paper and they blended in nicely. Next I added the base and caps. Each one was slid into place and then fastened to the columns with two inch nails from my finish nailer. Once those were set, I measured and cut each return for the caps and bases. I trimmed the existing base molding on the walls so I could run the column base molding all the way across. Since the returns were so small, I held them in place with 23 gauge pins that were an inch and three eighths long. Not only do these pins hold well, but they don't leave much of a hole to fill. The last step was to caulk all of the new joints and, like I did before, I used a composite shim to clean up the caulk, leaving nice clean corners. A quick wipe with a damp paper towel and this job was done. All that was left to do was let the homeowner paint their new columns. While this project took a little bit longer than I expected, it did provide some good lessons, including to think ahead during the build process so I could avoid some of those whoops moments. Now that the columns are installed, they look great, and my customer is happy with the new look of their entryway. I'd love to hear what you think about this project, and maybe there was something I could have done easier or more efficiently. Drop them in the comments below. If you enjoyed this project, give us a thumbs up and share it with your friends. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and maybe the bell so you get notified each time I put out a new video. There are a lot of new projects coming down the pike, and you don't want to miss those. So for now, have a great day, stay safe, take care. We'll see you soon.